As we look to the cross of Calvary where our master died and he suffered, but he rose again. And the component of the fact that he rose again is going to be our meditation and celebration on Easter Sunday in palace grounds at 9.30 a.m. Now, if you come here this Sunday, it simply means you forgot what I said. We will be in palace grounds this Sunday, that is on Easter Sunday at 9.30 a.m. It will be a beautiful combined service of all of our uh, four worship services, all our church people. We are coming together as a family to worship the Lord. But today we are going to meditate on the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ come? God could have sat in heaven. Why did he come to earth? What is the need for God to come? Why did God have to become a human? Didn't God enjoy his God status? These days some people get confused with themselves. They want to change their hairstyle. They want to change their clothing style. People who are dark in skin are applying chemicals to look fair. And people who are fair will not come from the beach. They are lying there to get a tan. <laughs> Cosmetic industry promises to almost transform your life. At least give you some good looks. Why did God have to go for a cosmetic change? Did God have struggles with his identity? Why did God, who lives in glory, want to become a human? Did God come for a vacation on the earth? What's the whole point of Jesus, God becoming human? Why did God become human? Why did he shed his blood on the cross? What's the need for him to have died on the cross? Does God ever die? Does God go through death? Can God die? All of these questions are answered in the Holy Bible. And the Bible says, God created you and me. I really like that scripture. God created you and me. Sometimes we feel, I am my own creator. No, God created us. You are not here by accident. You are not here because two people loved each other. You are here because God loved you. <laughs> but before I was born, where was I? Who was I? Before I was born, was I there? Yes, you were there. Yes, you were there. You were an idea, a thought, a living, pulsating thought, a plan in the mind and the heart of God Almighty. Because the Bible says, even before the foundations of the earth was laid, God was thinking about each one of us. 25 years ago, a supercomputer could manage so much of data, a few billion gigabytes of data. But today, supercomputers are able to manage trillions and trillions of gigabytes and data. Artificial intelligence has taken it to another level. All these computers and their ability to remember their ability to process is a joke compared to the greatness of God. God's greatness is immeasurable. Even a supercomputer cannot understand the greatness of God. God is so great. Each one of us and our data and the DNA and RNA that we are made of was planned by God Almighty. We are masterpieces of God's creation. Even before you can learn to love yourself, God loved you. Even when you hate yourself, God still loves you. Even when no one loves you, God still loves you. And when everyone loves you, God still loves you. God loves you and his greater love for us was expressed in his fellowship. It was God's idea. You and I are God's idea. <coughs> and therefore, 
the bible says god who is love god who is love one of god's character is love when you look at the god of the bible the bible says god is a spirit god is love a few things that god are without contradicting each other the woman of your house is the mother of your children but she is also sometimes the chef of the house in some cases she is also the cleaner of the house and at times she is the teacher in the school or a journalist in the vocation or a judge in the court room or in bedroom whatever or in living room or in the neighborhood she is also a judge in public in private she wears multiple hats does that contradict no it doesn't the same person wearing different hats god is a spirit god is love and the essence of love is to share is to share how do you know two people are in love they want to share everything they want to share their living space they want to share the things that they have they want to share their future together they want to share past memories they want to share details of their life because they trust one another love always fellowships how do you know someone is not in love with you they don't want to communicate they don't want to spend time as a choice but sometimes people's work life is so bad that there is no time for each other that's a different thing but i'm talking about the choice when there is a choice and they still don't want to be with each other that's because they don't love each other the proof that somebody doesn't love another is that they make a choice not to spend time with them not to whatsapp them not to talk to them not to be involved in their space not to be involved with them in any way but when two people love each other depending on how much they love each other they will leave everyone else and they will focus on each other they go for a prayer meeting after looking at god they look at each other after sharing with god they will share with each other they want to share depending on how much they love they want to share their privacy their trustworthiness with one another children because there's so much love between parents and children they share everything they share the living space they share the vehicle they share the toilets bedroom living room plates from which they eat everything is shared why because there's love no parents will tell the children uh, you can't enter my car you can't sit on my bike no in fact children are taught everything we have is yours love love makes you want to be intimate god was so much in love with us that he decided to form us he decided to shape us he decided to make us in his image hallelujah god decided to make us like him because he wanted us to be sons and daughters of the most high god god said i'll put my image on you you will be my children and god planted us in the planet earth that is how we came on earth until then we were in the mind of god where was i before i was born you were a idea you were a living thought in the mind of god you didn't know yourself but god knew you now the bible says god gave us a form he gave us a figure from the elements of the planet earth why did god take us from the planet earth and create our body because our body has to interact with the earth therefore he took us from the earth some people say we were created in some other planet and brought to the earth no that is completely a lie because when you die whether they burn the body or they bury the body elements of the body go back to the soil they have not found any element in our body which is from mars or venus which is from any other heavenly space why because we were taken from the earth 
the body was taken from the earth. God squeezed us into a beautiful shape and breathed his spirit into us. Just like each one has your own body, each one has your own mind, each one have our own spirit. We are not one universal spirit. Each one have your own spirit. Like your body has a passport on the earth and your mind has a marks card from the university, your spirit has an identity before God. You are not one combined spirit with somebody else. You are an individual. We are created in the image of God. And God planted us on the planet earth to represent God. Sometimes somebody calls your family for a party. So you say, we can't come, but my daughter is coming. She'll represent us. There is a family meeting. Husband and wife are busy. They say, our son will represent us. We are unable to come. God said, my children will represent me on the planet earth. And he planted us here to represent him and to have his plan conducted on the earth. And when God created us, he created us to live forever. How many of you have a desire to die? Thank you for not raising your hands. How many of you have a desire to live long? Those who didn't raise hands for both, meet me later. I want to know <laughs> what is your plan in life. Everybody wants to live long. Nobody wants to die. How did that desire come in you? Pastor, I don't have money to pay next month's rent, but you want to live? Pastor, I'm running from Bangalore because I don't have the money to pay EMI, but you want to live? How did that desire to live come? The desire to live comes in us. The desire to live forever comes in us because we were created like that. Every molecule, every cell in our body has a desire to live forever because God created us to live forever. Our creation was to live forever. And it was the Japanese scientists who came up with the idea of aura. What is aura? They say that there is a small energy, a small light emitting from every human body. Your body also has that. You can't see it in the mirror. It is so very minuscule that you need special cameras to catch it. How did that happen? That happened when God created us long ago. When he created us, he created us like a bulb, like a tube light. Not in the mind, in the body. God created us like a light. You didn't need to wear clothes. Your light from the body covered your nakedness. And the Bible uses the word glory for it. God clothed us with glory. God created us to live forever. We are created in God's image. We were here to represent God and we were clothed with glory. Fashion industry was not there that time. And every day in the evening, God would physically come down. Some people call it theophany, which means a revelation of Jesus, our Lord, in the Old Testament. Jesus would come or God would come and walk with Adam and Eve. In other words, they walk together. Married people, special attention. They walked together and God walked with them. Why did God create us for fellowship? So every day God would come and walk. People in the city, thank God for your vehicle. Thank God for your car, bike. Thank God you are flying everywhere. But walk every day. It is very helpful for health. Walk every day. And when you walk, don't put rock music and somebody's uh, uh, philosophy in your ears. Walk with Jesus every day. Take time to meditate on God's goodness every day. But the problem was, there is an element called Satan. There is an element called devil, evil. There are many fancy names given to that wrong character. He was, or she was, whatever it was, an angel. Angels are sometimes above gender. There are different types of angels. God created angels for God's service. What, what, actually what all happens in heaven, boss? In Bangalore, we don't have time. Do you think heaven is a jobless place? 
There's so much of work in heaven. When we get there, we will know. It's a very busy place. Some people are waiting. Once I go to heaven, I'll holiday. <laughs> Welcome, bro. Yeah, it's a place of rest, but it's also a place of work. A lot of work. God is a working God to a point that he never sleeps nor slumbers. Really? You want to say amen? Okay, anyway. <laughs> because I was going to say, in heaven we'll also be like that. There's no sleep or slumber in heaven. Amen. So God created us. Every day he would walk with us. But before that, in heaven, God had created angels. They are still there. Angels are also spirit beings and some of them have bodies which are very similar to human body. There are a variety of angels, of heavenly beings. There are different departments of God and uh, there are a variety of angels. One of the group of angels became very proud. Sin did not start on the earth. Sin is also a heavenly product. In a negative sense. Sin started in heaven. This angel had too much pride. Anybody feeling too much pride about nothing? Being proud about your efforts is not wrong. Being proud about your wise choices is not wrong. But being proud to a point that you're not willing to learn, being proud to a point that you don't submit to God's plan, is the pride that is destructive. Self-esteem, feeling good for your success is not bad. But when you look at your skin color and feel proud that you're better than another, especially for things that you didn't work, but you got it through some kind of a gift, and you use that to feel superior to others, it is the same pride that destroyed the angel and made him a cursed devil that is probably bothering your mind. Don't give it space in your mind because you are a child of God. Pride is not a good thing, especially when it is the negative pride. So God said to Satan, you are cursed. You can't be in heaven because heaven is a place only for blessedness. And he was cast down. It was not one angel. It was a group of angels. It was a union. It was a big uh, crowd. They all fell from heaven. Alas, they fell on the earth. And they destroyed the earth, which God had created. And the Bible says, God gave human beings the authority over the powers of evil. And said, no evil will touch you. You have the authority. Maintain the garden. God did not create concrete jungle. He created fruitful garden. Architects, I'm not saying anything wrong against your plan, but God's landscaping was a garden. God did it so beautifully. Then the Bible says, this human beings, every evening they walk with God, but unfortunately, when God is not there, they walk with Satan. They started talking to Satan. Some of us have become experts. Good Friday and Easter, we are with Jesus. Other days we are with whoever. That is what we are talking about. They began to balance. It's little time with Jesus, gospel music, praise the Lord, God, reading the Holy Bible, all that there is a discipline. But after that, or along with that, they read the secret books, dirty music, Little bit of pornography, little bit of hatred and unforgiveness in the mind. All that parallelly going together. Giving money to God in the church and giving money for wrong websites in private life. Mm. Did you notice the number of amens going down? <laughs> this is what happened to Adam and Eve. First creation of God began to balance sin and righteousness. And eventually, you see, if you fellowship with Satan, Satan is rebellion, injustice, evil, full of pride that doesn't learn, that doesn't listen. It has the bad pride, doesn't have the good pride. Began to convince, especially the lady, began to convince the lady, if you can disobey God, you will become like God. The point is this, you are already like God, you are created in the image of God. But Satan, there is no one that can do advertising like Satan. 
Satan is a master in selling an ice to an Eskimo. Satan is too good with deception. Somebody sitting here thinking, I deceived my girlfriend, she don't know. Satan. <laughs> it's a satanic thinking, manipulation, satanic work. Satan manipulated the lady to a point where she believed not what God said, but what Satan said. And she disobeyed God. And when she met her husband, she told her husband, I disobeyed God, you also disobey God. He also disobeyed God. He decided to listen to his woman instead of listening to his God. Woman listened to Satan, man listened to woman, all disobeyed God. And sin brought death which God had not created. God had created only life. Sin, sickness, curse, everything entered into the bloodstream of human beings. The glory of God went away. Today, if you want to see the light on your body, you need Japanese camera. Those days you could see the brightness in each individual that it covered their nakedness. Now fashion industry started. The first fashion industry was by Adam and Eve company. It was made of fig leaves. I'm not giving anybody ideas. I'm just saying what happened in the past. <laughs> they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. And the Bible says when the light shined on it, it became dry and it all curled up and again they felt ashamed. They were hiding away from God. This is what Judas Iscariot also did. Judas Iscariot, he went and betrayed Jesus. Instead of coming and saying sorry to Jesus, he went and confessed in the neighborhood church. And they said, we can't forgive you. By the time he wanted to ask forgiveness, Jesus was crucified. And so he went and hanged himself. When you commit a mistake, don't run away from God, run towards God. Amen. Pastor, I am wrong, how can I face God? You are wrong, that's why you need God. Amen. When you are sick, don't be ashamed of a doctor, run to the doctor. When you are not able to study, don't be ashamed of the teacher, run to the teacher. When you have financial problem, don't run away from the bank, run to the bank. Discuss how you can sort things out. When you don't have job, don't run away from the opportunity, run towards the opportunity. When you have sin and loneliness and you're not able to change, don't run away from God, run towards God and say, God, I need you and he will be there. <laughs> to hide from God, they went and hid behind a tree. I'm telling you, this is crazy. They know God can see everything. They know God knows everything, but still they ran and hid. Why did they hide? Listen, when the knowledge of sin came, mistaken knowledge began to rule. The Bible says when they sinned, they became knowledgeable. The eyes of their understanding opened. The problem with that Sinful understanding is, you have understanding, but it's a wrong understanding. A right understanding comes through righteousness. Wrong understanding, they went and hid behind a tree. And God is playing hide and seek with his own children. Adam, where are you? God, can't you see they are hiding behind a tree? You are God who knows everything. God says, I know where they are hiding. I know what they did. I know everything. But I have given them free will. If they want to hide, I will not expose them. There will be a day of judgment. That day I will expose them. But until that time, I will not expose them. It is their freedom and choice if they want to come out. Calling them is my responsibility. I will call them. But coming out is their responsibility. This morning through the voice of a man in chocolate skin. God continues to call. Responding is your choice. God will not come and catch you in your house. God will not come and catch you on that chair. God will only call you saying, come, I love you. Where are you? Come to me. I will help you. I will take care of you. 
God will only call you. You have the freedom to come to God or to run away from God. Thankfully, Adam answered and said, God, I am hiding because I am naked. God said, who told you you are naked? What was God's point? I had given you my glory. You can't be naked. Hallelujah. And Adam says, uh, and God says, did you commit sin? Yes, Lord. Come out. They come out. God says, why did you do this, Adam? And he says, this wife which you gave me, <laughs> which you created, manufacturing defect, Lord. <laughs> You gave me, this is your product. You gave me gift. What can I do? It malfunctioned. My condition is like this. God looked at woman and said, you are such a beautiful thing I created. Why did you do this? God, this Satan. This Satan confused me. God looked at Satan. Satan was the most confessional person. Did not blame anybody. Said, hey, hey, sir, yes, sir, I sin. <laughs> My question is this. If God could forgive Adam and Eve, why didn't God forgive Satan? Answer is, Adam and Eve sought forgiveness. They wanted to somehow get back to God. Satan don't want to get back to God. Satan knows who God is. Satan knows the reality of everything. But he has no desire to get back to God. Some people feel bad for Satan. Don't feel bad. Feel bad for yourself. <laughs> you don't have to feel bad for Satan because Satan knows more than what you know about God. In fact, the Bible says in the book of James, Satan knows God so much he shivers before God. Anybody shivering here? Thankfully, nobody. Satan shivers before God. But still he will not repent. Knowledge does not give you eternal life unless you respond to that knowledge in a humble way. Adam and Eve had a sense of repentance and God did the first sacrifice in the Garden of Eden and through the sacrifice of the blood of the innocent animal and then through the skin of that animal, God covered them. And God began to distance himself, not because God wanted to distance, but sin separated them from God Almighty. Fellowship with God was broken because sin of doubting God, sin of disrespecting God's plan, sin of disrespecting God's image on you, sin of hiding from God, sin of blaming and not confessing. And that sin entered the bloodline of humanity and passed on to every human that is born. Every human born on the earth has that sin in them. Whether they are a pastor, a bishop, a pope, whether they are normal human beings, whether they are philosophers, whether they are some great prophet or they are some great uh, <coughs> holy man, sin entered the bloodline. Now God made a promise to Adam and Eve. They are so sad. What to do? We lost everything. God said, don't worry. The seed of a woman will be born. Excuse me, Lord. Biology problem. The way you created us, only man has the seed. A woman will fertilize the seed and a baby will be born. But the seed of a woman, that doesn't exist. God said, no, there is coming the seed of a woman. There will be a virgin birth when I will become a human. Like how through the first man, Adam, sin passed on everybody, through the last Adam called Jesus, righteousness will pass on everybody. Romans chapter 5. Let's read together. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life. That's why the Friday Jesus died is called Good Friday. Go ahead, give God a big hand.
right from the balcony, the ground floor, the staircase, the overflow, the extended overflow. Those who are standing, put your hands together and give the work of Calvary of Jesus a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah. About 2.4 billion people on the earth called Christians and millions, millions and billions of secret or people who hold private belief without publishing it in Christ Jesus today thank him for his death on the cross. Because God put a price on sin and said anyone who sin will die. Now all human beings have to die. Not because you did something wrong, but because wrong became a part of our inherited quality. It's not a virtue, but it came into us. And therefore, Jesus was born of a virgin without a man. Why? God's word became flesh in her womb. How did that happen? If you can be made from mud, can't God make from the word? God... I also said that because sometimes we feel really great when we, when we, <laughs> when we get promoted from a 100cc bike to a four-wheeler Maruti 800cc. Some horns come in some people. Some people when they move from a 1BHK to a 3BHK, then they walk differently. My friends, there's nothing like enjoying God's grace, thanking him for the gift of righteousness through a humble spirit. Hallelujah. That experience is called born again. When you say, Lord Jesus, I know you were born of a virgin without the sin line of humanity. You were born through the conception of the word becoming flesh. Albert Einstein told us, energy becomes mass. Actually, Albert Einstein was explaining John chapter 1. Energy became mass and the word became flesh. God's supernatural energy by the word became mass in her tummy, in her womb. God became human. And the Bible says, this God, when he was born, he was tempted like everyone else. Yes. He was tempted like everyone else. Jesus was tempted to get angry at those who were unfair while playing with him. Jesus was tempted, especially when those teenage girls were hanging around. Jesus was tempted to feel depressed with that pimple on his face. Jesus, the Bible says, went through every temptation that human beings go through. Some of you are staring at me very angry. Why are you talking about Jesus like that? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus overcame temptation. Now you understood the difference. Correct. Jesus overcame temptation. And that grace he will give to us. The Bible says Satan came to Jesus many times and tried to stop Jesus from his righteousness. But Jesus knowing who he was, Jesus was fully God and fully human. Jesus was fully God and fully human. He was not half God, half human. No, sometimes God, sometimes human. No, he was fully God and fully human all the time. And the Bible says... He came to bear our sin on him. Somebody had to pay the price. Heaven's gates were closed. Somebody had to pay the price. But whoever pays the price is invalid because we are all sinful. Somebody righteous had to pay the price without sin in them. Only that would qualify the demand of God. And therefore Jesus suffered for us. Was it like Jesus was accidentally arrested like somebody gets arrested in Delhi or something like that? No, not at all. Jesus knew he was going to get arrested and he came to be arrested and he didn't fight against it. He didn't appeal against saying, oh, don't arrest me, please. No. 
Let's read Matthew chapter 17 verse 22 to 23. Because I've heard some people saying, if Jesus knew he was going to be arrested, no, he would have escaped. But they caught him because he didn't know. Read your Bible, brother. Don't read comics about Jesus. Read Bible. What does the Bible say? As Jesus and his disciples were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the son of man, Jesus is talking about himself. Jesus called himself son of God, son of man. All of those words and I don't have time to explain why. But there were prophetic references to that language. So he called himself that prophetic language. The son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him. But he will be raised on the third day. And disciples were greatly distressed when they heard that. Jesus is saying, guys, we are going to Jerusalem. And you know, I am going to be crucified. And before I'm crucified, I'm going to suffer. In fact, the Lord Jesus, on a Thursday night probably, <coughs> was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. We call it Maundy Thursday. My personal feeling is when I read the timeline of the Bible, I think it was on a Wednesday evening that Jesus was arrested. But we're not here to argue about the date, so we leave that part. <coughs> Jesus was arrested. And he was first taken to the court of Sanhedrin, the court of the Jewish people. Three times they took him from the Jewish court to the Roman court. Back from the Roman court to the Jewish court. In both the courts, Jesus was interrogated, investigated in one night, six times. Three times in Jewish court and three times in Roman court. In Jewish court, they beat him and punish him. In the Roman court, they beat him and punish him. You know, when, at one point, somebody looked at Peter and said, Peter, it was actually a lady. She looked at Peter and said, Peter, you also look like the disciple of Jesus. And Peter said, I don't know him. And the Bible says, immediately the roster began to crow, began to make noise. And Jesus looked at Peter because Jesus had told Peter, you will deny me three times. Before the rooster can wake up early in the morning. Throughout the night, Jesus went to six courts, basically two courts, three times each. He was wounded by then. When Jesus looked at Peter, the Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. Probably because when Jesus looked at Peter, he was already bleeding all over. And through that pain, blood-soaked face, as he looked at Peter, Peter couldn't take the guilt. Because Jesus had told him, you're going to deny me. And Peter said, you don't know me, Lord. Ye dosti. Nei You know, <coughs> all the commitments you make in fasting prayer, if you want to keep it, you need God's grace. Don't depend on your muscle strength. It is good to have muscle strength. Don't depend on your willpower. That is good. Use it. But don't depend only on that. Depend on his grace and he will keep you even in the most difficult times. I want to conclude. Jesus suffered so much. He suffered and finally after torturing him. So why did they torture Jesus so much? Because Romans, the Roman culture is if somebody is destined to be crucified to death, then they will not torture that person much. Because anyway, he's going to be crucified. <coughs> Why did they torture Jesus? <coughs> Jewish people tortured Jesus because they hated Jesus. Why did they hate Jesus? Primarily because Jesus taught against the mistakes of the Jews. Second, <coughs> Jesus did not use, the Lord Jesus did not use his power for the political freedom of the Jewish people. So they said, you are a Desh Drohi. You are a anti-national fellow. You should love the nation of the Jewish. You have so much power. Why don't you use it to liberate us from the Roman dominion? So they had different reasons to why they crucified Jesus. And why did the Romans really hurt Jesus? They had a stupid, foolish idea. Their idea was, if we hurt Jesus so much that 
the Jewish people will feel sympathy for him, then we don't have to crucify him because he's innocent. So they hurt him so bad. In fact, Isaiah the prophet about 400, 600 years before this could happen, through the prophetic lens wrote and said this. Let's read Isaiah chapter 52. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond. Jesus' face, they pulled out the beard, they put a crown of thorns on his head, they beaten him with lashes that pulled out flesh from his body. Some historians say that his bones were visible. They had crushed him. Isaiah the prophet had already said, he don't even look like a human being. Why? The sin of humanity was placed on Jesus. So that the righteousness of Jesus could be placed on us. God said, let's do a barter system. Let's do an exchange. I will come and take your sin and the penalty of your sin. You please take my righteousness. You please take my blessing. You please take my life. That's what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering of our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You know, brothers and sisters, as you hold the communion in your hands and you look at the bread and you look at the grape juice, symbolic of his body that was broken on the cross, symbolic of his blood, that was shed on the cross. You do it with utmost respect because he went to the cross simply because he loves us. God is love. You lose nothing when you receive him, but you gain everything when you receive him. All of you who are baptized according to God's word, have a commitment, hold up that communion element. We're gonna sing a song and then we will pray together Eat of his holy body and drink of his precious blood together. If there's somebody here who has not yet committed your life to the Lord, make that commitment today saying, Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to bear my sin. No Guruji will suffer for others. No friend wants to die for others. You went to the cross for me. I want to thank you, Lord. Just as Adam's sin passed on everyone, Thank you that for those who are born again. Thank you that for those who believe in you, Lord, your righteousness flows upon us and your blood is ever present to cleanse us. Holding the communion elements shall we sing together. Mm -hmm. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dear rest and for a world. Of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish me your rugged cross till my throne is at last I lay. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world 
has a wondrous attraction for me. Thank you, Jesus. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory about to bear it to the Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged And exchange it someday for a crown in that old rug stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that cross Jesus suffered and died To pardon and sanctify me So I'll cherish the old Till my throne is at last I lay down I will cling Oh yes And exchange it someday For a crown before we sing that last answer, maybe some of you want to kneel down. Maybe some of you want to stand. Maybe some of you just want to sit. Whatever is your expression of reverence, today is a day to commemorate the death and the sufferings of our Lord. Take that posture while we sing this last answer. All of us today want to rededicate our life to the Lord as we sing it for the last time, the last answer. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true It's shame and reproach gladly Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old It's someday for a Precious Lord, this wonderful morning as we commemorate how you suffered for our sin and gave us the free gift of life. Thank you that you gave us wisdom not to be foolish to reject the free gift. There's nothing we lose when we believe in you. You give it free and we thank you. Thank you that by your stripes we are healed. Thank you that this morning 
the power of the blood of Jesus flows here. Lord, we thank you. Thank you that we have come to the body of your broken, the blood which was shed. Thank you. As we eat and drink of it, may the life of your Holy Spirit flow in our body, in our mind, and penetrate our spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And let's eat of his holy body and drink of his precious blood together. Most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, really thank you. Thank you that we belong to you. Thank you that you purchased us with your own life, with your own blood. Thank you for giving us eternity and the assurance that once we are born again, there's no rebirth, there is no condemnation, there is no disappearing into nothing, there is no hell. It is only eternal life with you. Thank you for that truth. Thank you that we don't have to live this life in our weakness or in the limitations of our own strength. But thank you that we can live this life in the power of your Holy Spirit, in the wisdom of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray and the people said, Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? We are going to pray and close. Holy Communion Sunday, sorry, Holy Communion Good Friday is different from regular services where we only meditate on the cross of Calvary. Uh, we don't pass out, usually we don't pass out bags for collecting offerings. So today we have not kept uh, any bins or anything for those who want to put offerings because we don't focus on anything else except the cross of Calvary today. Now, I know many of you want to give to God. Sunday there will be that opportunity. But this cup, when you're leaving, please drop it in the bin meant for it. And Easter Sunday, two days from now, we'll all gather together in palace ground to celebrate our risen Lord and Savior. You know why today is called Good Friday? Story didn't end. Story didn't end. Warm welcome to Pastor Justin. Thank you, Pastor. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day, this Good Friday. Lord, that 2,000 years ago, you choose, Lord God, to die for us, to die for humanity, for mankind. And we thank you for the beautiful transaction that took place on the cross. Lord, where you took all our sin, all our shame, and that you gave us life and hope. And thank you, Lord God, for the abundant life that you have promised. Thank you for speaking to us so clearly through your word. And Father, we pray for each and every one that is gathered here. I pray, O oh Lord God, that our lives will be lived in thankfulness for your greatness Lord God, for your sacrifice, and that every moment, Lord God, we will be ever thankful, O Lord God, and be your witnesses, be witnesses of the resurrection power. And Lord God, that we will honor you through our lifestyle. I pray that you will send each and every one of us, Lord God, in peace. And Father, as we look forward for the Resurrection Sunday, we pray, O Lord God, that great things you will do in each and every one of our lives and that you will bless our homes, that you will bless our city, you will bless our country, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for greater things that are yet in store for us who believe in you. Send us with your peace. We pray for all those that have come here for the very first time. I pray that their lives will never be the same again. Send us with your peace in Jesus' most holy and matchless name. We pray and everyone say, Amen. Amen. And now may the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
The love of the Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God rest and abide with us from now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Have a blessed rest of the day. If you are here for the first time, please walk up to the guest lounge. There's a wonderful team there waiting to meet with you. And uh, we will meet in Tripura Vasani on Sunday for the Easter service. God bless.